Hello, and welcome to this week's program of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. My name is Frahin, and I'm so excited that you have joined us today. Each week, we connect with and hear from speakers who usually have a message focused on our love for innovation, entrepreneurship, and education. Today, we have a presentation by our very own E-Club member, Martina Spann, based in Spain. She is a mom of two, a banker, a stockbroker, and a sworn and certified translator for Spanish and German. Martina has a master's in development, development management with a focus on countries with armed conflict and has an ongoing PhD studies project in education. Her thesis is on peer mediation in schools in Medellin, Colombia, and will be talking to us more about her findings. With that said, Martina, please take it away. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Well, as you've already heard, this is a topic that's very, very dear to my heart. It was actually also uh, my thesis in, in my master's, not only in the PhD, and it is, uh, well, the, the project that all this started with is a global grant of the Rotary Foundation between uh, the Rotary Club of Medellin and uh, Marbella Guadalmena. So, um, why school mediation and what is it all about? Conflict is inherent to life and people. Conflicts happen in our daily lives because we communicate with people. People have different viewpoints, norms, values. They've lived different experiences and already a conversation with different opinions can lead to conflict. And as these conflicts do happen in daily life, in the family, with friends, etc. cetera. Um, they do not exactly stop in front of the school gate, but the children bring them inside and, uh, well, they get transported into the classroom where they can cause extra problems. Also, we have to see that in the last decades, uh, the world has experienced and social changes um, that had uh, great impacts in, in various contexts. Um, and the school, which is a subsystem of our society, does not remain indifferent. Um, we have seen uh, different educational contexts face new challenges and they uh, require new creative responses. The diversity of the educational community um, often translates into conflicts that, if they aren't adequately resolved, can transform school environments into negative and problematic and even into very sick places. Um, I think it is um, known because the media uh, takes it up a lot that bullying has become a very severe problem in schools and with the internet uh, this problem has increased as the suffering of the bullied child does not stay in school. It is taken home as conflict uh, does not stay in front of the school gate, the conflicts that are developed in school are not staying in school. They are tra transported back home and uh, with the internet, sometimes it goes on 24 seven because in the social media, it continues and continues. And there are extreme cases where children even commit suicide, suicide because they can't uh, deal with the pressure. And um, also we know nowadays, psychologists know that um, the fear that the child has before he goes to school, he, she goes to school, um, is as real as a real attack. So the fear of being attacked in the school is as real for the mind as a real attack is. And um, well, um, as um, school mediation has started more or less in, in the mid eighties, first in the United States, but then also in Europe, and uh, we have enough studies uh, up to now, although the long term um, effects are still not sufficiently studied because very often uh, investigators don't have the time to investigate a project for five, six, seven years to really see what it does. But we know that many conflicts in schools never get solved because there are the methods missing to identify the conflicts and you cannot tackle anything you haven't identified before. 
So um, one of the most complete investigations that we have in that respect, it was undertaken in 60 schools, precisely in New York, Philadelphia, and San Francisco, between 8,000 students between 11 and 18 years and 500 teachers, showed that 90% of all conflicts remained unsolved or were even resolved in a destructive way. It is a terrible number, actually. So, um, like I said, we have undergone a lot of social changes in, in a very short period of time, and the rapidly changing globalized world uh, leaves education each time more in the hands of schools because the parents both work and have very little time, often very little time for the children. And also it is a request by the parents, we also see that in, in, in the schools, because I've been on school boards for 20 years, that it is a request by the parents that the schools undertake education that before was done by the parents, that the school does that now. Um, well, um, this rapidly changing world holds a great potential for conflicts as it puts society into situations where people aren't used to. People cohabitate that did not have to cohabitate before. Although um, one has to see that it's not only because of migration, different backgrounds, because when I started investigating what is culture and does culture have an impact, I started that with my master thesis. It all of a sudden became the biggest part of my study. What is culture? Because you can have a different culture from one house door to the next. And it's the same quarter of town. It's similar families. But the way of thinking is so different that it makes it a different culture. So like I said, um, today schools um, increasingly also transmit values uh, that are necessary for living together that before were transmitted in the homes. And uh, it's a task that's vital because young students will one day become um, adults and they will shape society. Some of them will be our politicians and shape the destiny of their country. Um, so um, it is an absolute necessity for a functioning society to um, educate young members in the principles of human rights, tolerance, democracy, good governance because we need a functioning future generation that keeps their nation stable that uh, brings prosperity if it's already there mm, well to keep it and many countries don't have pr prosperity so to lead their country into a way of, of, of prosperity this is already the booklet of the project in Medellin that I will talk about later. And so uh, what do uh, school mediation programs seek? Um, they start resolving conflict by teaching the smallest. Um, mediation is a democratic, non-punitive method um, to resolve uh, conflicts, which is nothing new. I think we all know the story where King Solomon gave the child to the mother there were two mothers that were fighting over a baby and he gave it to the one that seemed to be the most concerned of the two because the other one wanted to cut the baby into two so could not have loved him so much. Um, yeah, what are school mediation projects about? It's learning at an early age how to resolve conflicts through dialogue and in a democratic way. Um, mediation projects are based on treating others the way you want to be treated yourself, Kant's imperative. Love can transform, transform a person, therefore educate with love. We all perceive things in a different way, understand these differences and how to live with them. And they become an opportunity instead of a threat. And to become a promoter of peace and committed to it and be proud of it. So why mediation between peers? Because we have learned that uh, peer mediators frame disputes in a different language which is much close to their fellow students and you don't have the hierarchies, which also helps a lot. It is crucial yet yeah, that the mediators learn to be impartial, maintain confidential the stories that they are being told and also stay fair with all the parties involved because it could be that they have to mediate between a friend and somebody they consider an enemy, but they have to be able to deal with that. So in mediation project, projects, the students are trained to think and plan strategically, 
in communication and dialogue, how to change behavior and values to analyze and understand why conflict occurs, to negotiate consensus, and which is very, very important, how to apply the newly learned skills to other life situations, because that means that you can, on the long term, change or complete the society, a society completely. You, you can let it trickle down into society and have a conflict-stricken society, a more peaceful society on the long term. So um, all this is done in order to achieve capacity building for conflict resolution, acceptance of people with different worldviews, values, backgrounds, creating students' ownership of a program through participation, very important to, to let them have participation and to let them have ownership empowering students through self-esteem and capacities, and then also to involve the parents and the teachers to influence overall positive community development, because then you really, really, really have it in overall society on the long term. And building trust and understanding of others, and as I said, eventually creating a more peaceful society overall. Mediation and conflict resolution projects provide a better school climate Yet, uh, their state of peace depends on the individual necessities, and every state of peace means that maybe something else which is of great value has to be given up. Well, um, also very interesting, uh, social studies investigating conflict suggests that children need to learn how to argue and resolve conflicts. Um, in the 1970s, uh, there was uh, there were strategies where um, teachers were trying children not to argue, but then they found out that these children are missing leadership skills. And to ex express dissent and defending one's own position is crucial for success in life, in the business world, and also in the personal life. Because if you can't stand your grounds, uh, you... Every animal, every wild animal has to learn that. So we need to learn that too. It's absolutely crucial in society. And now I will very briefly talk about my own uh, investigation um, and how the whole thing started. It started with the Rotary project of Rotary Club uh, Medellin, uh, which I found in, in a Rotary magazine and I seek the project and I suggested the grant to them. Um, and uh, we're still great friends, and it's a marvelous ongoing project, which is in, in 200 schools by now. Um, Colombia had 52 years of armed conflict, the longest civil war in modern history, and um, violence is still a problem in, in Colombian society. So they have um, the curriculums with the subject of peace, um, but of course, I mean, 52 years have taken its tour, and it takes time also to, to reverse that process. Um, it has a very beautiful name. It's called Agamos Las Paces, Let's Make, make Peace. Yeah, um, and as I already said, they are in 200 schools by now. They have this global grant. It was worth uh, 38,000 euros, and they have really done wonders with it. It was so beautiful to see the young students and how they apply um, the newly learned skills and absolutely magnificent how, how it works. Um, it is a peer project, but also the teachers are involved to, um, to also, um, when the children feel overwhelmed, which they sometimes do because they are as young as eight years old and sometimes they need the teacher to help out. This is uh, the peer group in the peer school. So you see how, how young they were. It was my first visit in, in 2016. This is uh, a little interview, which I won't play in because we don't have the time. And uh, I would like to finish um, with uh, Mr. Gandhi, who wrote to Maria Montessori in 1931 you have very truly remarked that if we are to reach real peace in this world, and if we are to carry on a real war against war, we shall have to begin with children. If they will grow up in the national, uh, natural innocence, we won't have to struggle, we won't have to pass fruitless, idle, 
resolutions, but we shall go from love to love and peace to peace until at last all the corners of the world are covered with that peace and love for which consciously or unconsciously the whole world is hungering. And with this, I finish my presentation. Here is the bibliography. And um, well, if you have questions, but already thank you for your attention and for listening to me. And I think I can, um, I can unshare screen, right? Yes, great. Yes. Martina, thank you thank so you. much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, please allow me to introduce the other member on the call. Uh, we have Rushton, who is based in the Bay Area with me. Uh, Rushton is our, is our charter president and um, a program master. That's that's the new title I'm going to give you uh, for the ECLO. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I just want to begin um, with uh, any any questions. Rushton, would you like to jump in? If not, I have a few. Um, sure, sure, sure. So in, in, in my experience, anything really meaningful always generates some level of misunderstanding and opposition, right? Just that just always happens. It, it seems um, in in working with uh, Agamos Las Paces um, in Colombia, did you encounter challenges to the implementation of the program that you had not expected uh, that that people were concerned about something uh, that surprised you or anything along those lines? Well, I must say um, that I did not implement the project. That was the Rotary Club of Medellin and the foundation um, Amor por Medellin, Love for Medellin, which was um, founded in the 70s in the worst times, um, well, when Pablo Escobar was uh, very, very active. Um, and um, well, in some schools, they found resistance because of the teachers did not see the program. But this is something that happens actually in all other countries too. We see that also in Spain, we see that in Germany, that simply the teachers say, we have no time. Uh, we are overwhelmed with the curricula um, already, so we can't do that. So this is basically um, what we mostly see, but the pilot school uh, where the photo came from, they are absolutely fantastic and they took it on very, very well. And from there it was replicated. So it went well, I must say. Excellent, thanks. Great. Uh, Martina, I know we couldn't watch that video, but can you describe a little bit about what that interaction was about? Oh, um, I mean, we, I can also play it to you. It's, uh, it's eight year old and uh, they simply talk about uh, how they um, how they feel when they get trained when they mediate and here maybe I, I would like to to tell an anecdote which I also told the other day at the Ryla that specific day where we took the picture um, when we took the picture we walked in and the creator of of the project she is a lawyer and a mediator in the courts and founded the project at the Rotary Club Medellin and so uh, the little children of eight years approached her running and, and, and they were completely, um, well, very disturbed. And, and they said, uh, Miss Didi, Miss, Miss Didi, we have to speak to you because this child in our class, he's, he's, the, he's the chief mediator and he completely takes advantage of his position. And it's absolutely horrible. And you have to save us and you have to help us. And, and, and then, and Didier said to, to them, well, let Martina ask her questions. And when she's finished, um, I, we will come to your prob problem. And something very interesting happened. The same children approached her again and said, we have to apologize to you because we completely neglected what you told us to do to solve the problem amongst each other, then go to the teacher if we don't find a solution. And only if the teacher doesn't find a solution for us, we can come to you. So we do apologize because we did not what we were told to do. And it was really, it touched me so deeply. And this is basically also what this video looks like. Um, they are completely, they have complete ownership of, of the project. I must say that I interviewed them again in 2020, these same children that I had interviewed in 2016. And they live it. They also believe that they can change the course of their country. 
Some want to become politicians and it's really doing marvelous things. And the young man who was chief mediator of the school, he was 19 at that time and he's studying uh, to become a lawyer today and he wants to be a human rights lawyer. So the project uh, creates uh, very, very good synergies and, and uh, well, creates marvelous stories. That's, that's really incredible because, you know, I, I think back to my own education here in the United States and you're right, like I, I don't think I was formally, I, I was never taught formally, you know, conflict mediation, peer mediation when up until, you know, high school, but then in college, I, I got to read a book called um, uh, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. And that really opened my eyes to how you can, um, yeah, deal with conflict in a, in, a, in a wholesome way, not in a, in a nonviolent way. Um, and that really helped me throughout, you know, after that, and I've been, I've been able to use that in my career and um, elsewhere. So um, I, I think that what you're, what you're saying and what in this specific, in this specific school as well, I think it's very powerful and I, and I wish more schools do it because um, especially here in the US, right? There's a lot of violence that happens in schools. A lot of, you know, uh, kind of physical violence. And, and I wonder if we yeah. have these types of peer mediation um, groups, teams helping with this and having conversations instead of physical violence, maybe we can actually get some real progress. You do, because it comes from the States. You know where it started? Please. Amongst the, 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 the law professions and the military who has great mediation services is the US military. Interesting. So in the courts, we, we know that it exists. Yeah. But of course, I also did my investigation. I did just not have a slide for that because sometimes I also explain where it comes from. There is a very, very interesting article. I think I even have it in the bibliography, which is Johnson and Johnson, 1996. And he describes that how it was created in the United States and then got into other areas of life. So in, in thinking about um, sources of conflict, sources of, of mediation, it, it, it seems to me in the United States that, that we are already oriented to competitive ways of interacting as opposed to cooperative, right? So. Uh, people certainly cooperate, uh, but but you know we have this fascination with with winning and losing, with uh, the the role of sports in our society, a lot of pieces like that. Um, is that in any way a part of the research you've done, or is it something that you feel like you've seen in other settings? It's actually not part of of my investigation, but I can tell you one thing. Europe is much less competitive in a certain way. It is in the schools, and I do not think I find it an advantage. I have lived in the States and I've grown up in Europe and in, I've lived in different European countries. I've lived, of course, in Germany, England and, and then in Spain for more than 20 years now. And um, I think it is important to be competitive. So I don't know whether being competitive is the problem. I would rather say the problem is not accepting that uh, somebody else has a different opinion or somebody else is different. And also, you know, I, I took out one slide. I had one more slide. Gandhi also said, the enemy is fear. We think it's hate, but it's fear. And I think this is very, very much where it comes from. Because I, like I said, uh, migration forces people uh, to live together that did not have to live together before. So of course you have this friction because people think differently. They come from completely different backgrounds. Like I said, you can have a completely different mentality at the next house door. But of course, if somebody comes from a different part of the world where the living situations were completely different, that of course gives different ex 
experience and different experience um, well makes you see things in a different way so i don't think it is per se being competitive as long as we have respect and acceptance for the other person to be competitive um, i would even say then you respect that somebody that's maybe better doing the job better or knowing more than you that he's not uh, that you're not entitled to the same thing this is something that i see in europe in Europe, very often, people think they are absolutely entitled to the same thing without noticing that they haven't made the same efforts. And I think it can't be like this. You still have to make an effort in order to get something and get somewhere in life. I find it crucial. It would be nice if there was like a, a good mix of, of both, right? Um, of course, but I don't think that it is being competitive. I think it's it's being like this, you know, and uh, getting the other one out of the way, um, whatever it costs. If you do it with respect, it's no problem. Great. Uh, great. Well, Martina, thank you very much. Uh, we're thank just you. about out of time, so I want to wind down this recording. Um, Rotary members and guests, please make sure you fill out the attendance section at the bottom of the page and leave us a comment as well. Uh, again, Martina, thank you very much. And I want to turn it back to you for your final words. Thank you so much for having me. Well, my final words, I really, really hope that we can achieve that piece that Gandhi was talking to, to Maria Montessori, and I'm convinced one day we will have a peaceful world, although sometimes it doesn't look like, but I'm truly convinced. Great. Thank you very much, and we'll see everyone else next week.